distinguished guests, dear students, young researchers, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Jan Hendrik Olbers. I'm the president of Humboldt, of the Humboldt Universität, and I'm delighted to see you here and um, to open your conference. There's a lot of discussion and ongoing research on Islam, on young Muslim men and women, and on the question of gender equality in predominantly Muslim, Muslim societies. And yet, more regionally focused perspective on these questions that would include South Asia and Southeast Asia is too often missing, considering the fact that the great majority of Muslims live in Asia today, it seems important to redirect our focus and increase the level of academic engagement and research on, re on regions such as South and Southeast Asia if we want to achieve the quality and quantity of research activities that have long been standard in Islam-related research on Arab-speaking countries, or more recently, on Europe. As one of Europe's leading cities of science and research, maybe it's better to say the leading city of science and research, Berlin, seems to be especially well positioned to establish milestones for this strategic direction. Let me just give you two examples. The Institute of Asian and African Studies at our university, Humboldt Universität, introduced a new master's program in modern South and Southeast Asian studies. And the Institute of Islamic Studies of uh, the Freie Universität established a junior professorship of Islam in South and Southeast Asia. Moreover, the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies, it is a cooperation project between both universities, has emerged as a focus point of vibrant exchange and cooperation among young researchers and scholars from all over the world, from various disciplinary backgrounds. And it is a place where scholars from Humboldt Universität and Freie Universität interact and work together. I am especially pleased that this dynamic cooperation includes the collaborative organization of international conferences like this one, and that the cluster of excellence normative orders at Goethe Universität Frankfurt is the third member of the conference organizing committee. Let me also extend a very warm welcome to our international conference delegates and eminent speakers from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and from Northern America who joined this conference to discuss questions such as the existing gender orders or new gender roles for men and women in South and Southeast Asia, as well as transnational feminist activities and not least the re reflexivity of their own research perspectives. On behalf of the organizers of this conference, I would like to thank the Gerda Henkel Foundation, the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies, and the Cluster of Excellence Normative Orders for funding this conference. Let me also thank Nadja Christina Schneider very warmly from the Institute of Asian and African Studies and her team for organizing this conference. Unfortunately, I cannot stay with you this afternoon because I have another appointment with a theological department just now. But finally, I thank you all for participating. I wish you a very successful and enjoyable conference. All the best for you. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, uh, my name is Vincent Hauben. I was a former director of the Institute of Asian Af African Studies here in Berlin. And I also want to extend a warm word of welcome here in this uh, very nice place in the heart of Berlin. I'll tell you 
few things about the Institute and about the kind of discussions that have been going on in our institutes uh, since a uh, couple of years and also how this conference fits perfectly within what is interesting ongoing intellectual debate on area studies. Now the Institute of Asian African Studies at, here in Berlin has a very interesting history. It started somewhere in the 1880s and was somehow connected to the African colonial enterprise of Germany. And um, uh, of course, a, a very interesting aspect of its history is also that it was part of Eastern Berlin during the division in the Cold War and played a quite distinctly different role compared to similar institutions in Western Germany. For instance, the, uh, the institute in the so-called East German period was enormous in amount of per personnel. I think there were about 40 to 50 professors working in this institute. It was a huge enterprise. Of course, after reunification, there was uh, some economizing going on, and at the moment, we, uh, we have about 13 full professors in the institute and a number of junior professors. So the institute has undergone some restructuring, but not solely for economic reasons, but also uh, because um, there is a discussion going on uh, over the last couple of decades on the role of area studies. And in this context, uh, we have um, 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 uh, started some important innovations, which is, makes our institute rather unique within Germany. One major innovation is the introduction of so-called cross-cutting professorial positions, which have a focus on particular teams that interconnect areas. And I think uh, Professor Nadja Schneider is the embodiment <laughs> of this idea, and um, she doesn't look very unhappy to me, so uh, maybe this idea was a good one. Um, yeah, the, the discussion on area studies is still ongoing, but I think there are some preliminary outcomes of this international discussion. So one thing that has become very clear is that we live in times of inter, increasing inter, interdependence in the wake of globalization. But at the same time, there's an increasing awareness that all things global are locally grounded and that any theoretical innovation is most likely to come from translating local phenomena into something which we can call grounded theories on areas that formerly used to be considered to be peripheral, but are far from prefer peripheral nowadays. A second intermediate conclusion I would like to draw from the international discussion on area studies is that area studies force us to rethink spatial and temporal configurations underlying our research. Areas can no longer be considered as closed containers. There is a heightened awareness that uh, people, goods, and ideas travel and have done so for a very long time. So there's a kind of discovery of new dynamics of this situatedness, and I think Reflections like these inform what we will be doing today and tomorrow. Now, as already mentioned by the president, uh, this, there's a bi-regional focus in this conference, and this indeed reflects also the design of our master on modern South and Southeast Asia. Because we consider the areas bordering the Gulf of Bengal as one area, characterized by many faceted processes of contact and exchange. And it's this rather old idea, but not in the form of a greater India. <laughs> We'd like to take up uh, again and uh, look at this big region, South and Southeast Asia as a whole. The theme of this conference also very much mirrors current preoccupations of many researchers working on South and Southeast Asia, since youth and Islam 
belong to the most important characteristics and have big societal relevance nowadays. And I think uh, a gender studies perspective on this twin uh, team needs to be extended as well. So in this context, we welcome it very much that within Berlin, between the Free University and the Humboldt University, particularly in the framework of the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies, on the one hand, and be between Berlin and Frankfurt, on the other hand, a close cooperation has already evolved in order to take up questions with regard to Islam in Asia. In conclusion, I would like to thank the organizers of this two-day event, Nadja Schneider, Professor of Mediality and Intermediality in Asian and African Societies at Humboldt University, Gudrun Kremer, Professor of Islamic Studies and the Director of the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies at Free University, and Susanna Schröter, Professor of the Anthropology of Colonial and Post-Colonial Orders, and head of the Cluster of Excellent Normative Orders at Goethe Universität Frankfurt for their efforts in making this conference possible. So I wish you all a very inspiring and productive days in Berlin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, to you, Professor Mina Sharifi Funk. Professor Sharifi Funk is an associate professor and member of the Graduate Faculty Department of Religion and Culture at Wilfrid Laurier University in the city of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. She specializes in Islamic studies with a focus on contemporary Muslim thought and identity. Her research interests include debates about the status of women in the Muslim world transnational networking among Muslim activists, patterns of interpre interpretation among North Amer American Muslim thinkers, and Islamic mysticism's impact on Muslim social values. Professor Sharifi Funk has published extensively on women and Islam, Islamic hermeneutics, and the role of cultural and religious factors in peacemaking. She has co-edited two books, Cultural Diversity, and Islam in 2003, and Contemporary Islam Dynamic, Not Static in 2006. In a monograph titled Encountering the Transnational, Women, Islam, and the Politics of Interpretation, which was published in 2008, she analyzes the impact of transnational networking on Muslim women's identity, thought, and activism. This book was really an eye-opener to me and I believe for many of us here who are interested in the new communicative and discursive spaces that have been created by Muslim women activists in recent years. Professor Sharifi Funk practices our scholarship of conversation, and you'll hear more about her approach in a minute, and this way of encountering enables her to understand and explain how conversations that transcend the borders of national communities are shaping the conduct and nature of women's activism. And I quote from her book, experiences of transnational dialogue are not only helping many Muslim women to transcend their experience of localized marginalization, but are also stimulating creative thought and creating a new hermeneutic field, a conversational space within which Islamic identity and intellectuality take on new meanings beyond defensive rebuttals of foreign ideas and reflexive imitation of the West. Facilitated in part by increasing access to the internet, these transnational conversations are stimulating new forms of critical discourse about gender relations and their attendant norms. I'm very pleased that she accepted our invitation to hold the keynote address to this conference. I'm also very happy to introduce Professor Claudia Derichs, who's sitting next to Professor Sharifi Funk, who will present a commentary on Professor Sharifi Funk's speech, keynote speech afterwards. Professor Derichs holds the Chair for Comparative Politics and International Development Studies at Philips Universität Marburg. The focal point of her research are the politics of the Near and Middle East, 
<clears throat> East and Southeast Asia, as well as political Islam and gender studies. Her research interests also include transnational women's activism, and she's currently supervising a research project on transnational advocacy networks of Muslim women. Let me just mention two of her recent publications. She has co-edited a volume titled Women and Politics in Asia, a Springboard for Democracy, which was published in 2011. And in 2010, she has edited a volume on diversity and female political participation views on and from the Arab world. A very warm welcome to both of you. I look forward to your presentations. And with that, I would like to hand over to Professor Mina Sharififank. Thank you. Guten Tag, guten Nacht. <laughs> oh, how I wish I knew German. Oh, the hermeneuticists of this beautiful country. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadia Christina Schneider. Thank you, Nora Durbel. And thank you to the organizing committee. We bow to you. It is an honor. Um, and my name is Sharifi, which of course means to be honored. So, Don Kashun. I'm going to do this to Jacob every time I need the slide to be put up. My goal for tonight is to try to shine some light on a subject that has often proved to be quite polemical, women and Islam. It is a subject that is surrounded by strongly held and divergent opinions, values, and beliefs as well as misconceptions, overgeneralizations, over and yes, political agendas. There are many competing projects attempting to define who Muslim women are and what their identities and values should be. Each project attempts in some way to establish or reinforce, you could say, a single narrative, a singular story that cannot possibly do justice to the multiple pressures and aspirations of real women in diverse social contexts. As a result, Muslim women are forced to live with contradictions. Really, all humans are forced to live with contradictions, but for this talk, Muslim women are forced to live with contradictions between the stories they would like to tell about themselves and the various stories that others are telling. As scholars, you know these stories very well. Islamist stories, secularist stories, traditionalist stories about what a real Muslim is, orientalist stories about helpless Muslim women who need to be, what, liberated. It is not easy to get around these stories. They colonize our intellectual landscape and fill our ideas with too many preconceptions and too many problematic representations that beg for proper debunking. Though I intend to address these preconceptions, and I, I will hopefully do a little bit of that, I hope to do something more than just rehash familiar debates. Rather, I would like to share with you some thoughts that emerge from my own efforts to practice what I call scholarship of conversation. In other words, scholarship of encountering. And I'm not going to go into a lecture of Heidegger, but I do love his thoughts on encountering. 
And I used a lot of his thoughts in my methodology chapter, but I won't talk about it. In other words, a scholarship of encountering that foregrounds the diverse ways in which Muslim women activists, enabled by transnational encounters, are rediscovering and articulating their own identities in new relational contexts, in which and in ways that have the power to destabilize some of our typical assumptions. By probing the first-hand testimony of Muslim women activists in diverse societies, I hope, of course, to move beyond the single narrative, approaches to gender and Muslim identity. How? I focus on ways in which various women understand the conflicts and contradictions in their own lives, and on the ways in which transnational conversations are stimulating reflexivity and the efforts, of course, to tell new stories. So rather than impose, you could say, a prefabricated intellectual structure or structures on these women, like Heidegger, for instance, I have attempted to develop grounded concepts, like what you had mentioned, by paying close attention to what transnationally engaged Muslim women are trying to say to us about complex realities and about identities they enact and contest on a daily basis, particularly but not exclusively to the South Asian, Southeast Asian context. Before proceeding further, I find it necessary to highlight some deficiencies in, inherent in conceptual frames pertaining to Islam and Muslim identities, particularly in the post-9-11 and war on terrorism contexts, and also in some current discussions about multiculturalism, Islam, and European identity. Among non-Muslims, as well as Muslims, it seems that everyone has become a stakeholder in the future of Islam, and that everyone is attempting to frame and reframe the discursive categories within which Islamic interpretation and politics are discussed. Each label, and there is a politics of labeling, each label for categorizing desi desirable types of Muslims and Islamic interpretations, whether defined by self-identified Muslims or non-Muslim observers, seems to have a ready counterpart category for branding adversaries of the undesirable others. As a result, one finds <laughs> Conservative Muslims compete with progressive or even ex-Muslims, hmm. as well as traditionalist Muslims denouncing self-hating Muslims and Islamophobes. Meanwhile, moderate Muslims challenge militant Muslims. See all my quotes. Putative Muslim refuseniks denounce Muslim extremists and would-be reformists repudiate apologists who refuse to embrace the need for change. What did I do? What did I just do? There are so many binaries when it comes to women in Islam. Liberal versus conservative, moderate versus militant, orthodox versus heretical, Everyone, it seems, has a party line. And about what? Who are the good Muslims? Who are the bad Muslims? Sadly, many of the dichotomies distort as much as they reveal, shrouding the complex opinions, beliefs, sentiments, and lived experiences of perceived adversaries through simple labels based on superficial preconceptions or 
oversimplifications. No wonder from the multiple and opposing agendas of Islamic interpreters emerge contradictory messages on a wide range of subjects. And on this slide, we see just a sampling, a, sam a small sampling of images of women and Islam that have appeared, of course, in the media. This sampling provides just a glimpse into this world of contradictions and binaries. In addition, one could say that at a time of heightened insecurities and acute threat perceptions, everyone has arrived at the conclusion that their identity and values are under attack. I have a four-year-old. Do I want to tell him that? <laughs> but like I say to my students, we are living in the residue of colonization, we are living in the residue of Islamic empire. Many different residues. Hence, there is a tendency to aspire toward the monopolization of public discourse by delegitimizing adversaries in order to save the real Islam, defined in staunchly traditional or authoritatively progressive terms. Though the contours of debate differ somewhat from region to region, the intellectual turbulence and fragmentation extends across continents, from North American through Europe and the Middle East, all the way, of course, to South and Southeast Asia. And this holds true in Canada, where I live and teach, as it does in other countries. And during the course of the last decade, there have been a series of debates and public controversies about how exactly Muslims fit into or don't fit into the Canadian public sphere, or you could also say the Canadian multicultural mosaic. As Canadians, we have seen the arrest of a group of Muslim youth known as the Toronto 18 on the charges of planning a campaign for homegrown terror, and heated debates over the possibility of Muslim faith-based arbitration in Ontario. And in Quebec, there has been a major public inquiry into questions of reasonable accommodation for minority Muslim communities, and girls wearing hijab while playing soccer have sparked a heated debate and an attempted ban. Also, there has been a federal level ruling against wearing the niqab, the face veil, at the voting polls. And once again in Quebec, a proposed bill, Bill 94, to prohibit Naqabi women from accessing public services. Meanwhile, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CPC, has produced a Muslim-themed situation comedy show entitled Little Mosque on the Prairie. Has anyone seen that? There you go. Which has, of course, been now syndicated worldwide. Mm, a lot of listing of different controversial issues happening in Canada, just to give you a feel for where I'm coming from. So in Canada, as in Europe, and of course America, Muslims are in the media spotlight under considerable public scrutiny. Now, in my research for the book Encountering the Transnational Women, Islam, and the Politics of Interpretation, I found it highly important to remain cognizant of these reductionistic tendencies and binaries, especially pertaining, excuse me, to the politics of women in Islam. It was precisely, it was precisely these issues, these issues that motivated me to probe further and see how my writing, 
might serve to amplify the authentic, nuanced voices of transnationally engaged Muslim women, women whom I came to appreciate for their capacities to challenge conventional assumptions and cliches. And I have been privileged, I'll say that. I come from a privileged class. I have been privileged to conduct research in a wide range of cultural, social, and national contexts. Consistently, I have found that increasing numbers of Muslim women activists have become dissatisfied with narrow, dichotomous choices and with social and political pressures that box them into a constrained sense of identity and a limited set of a with us or against us option. And one way in which they are seeking to transcend some of the pressures I have described is by seeking forms of relationship with one another that are grounded in transnational solidarity and dialogue. And so several years ago, I arranged research trips to Egypt, Omedonia, Morocco, Al Anka al Maghreb, England. Karen Armstrong calls it my little island. <laughs> Iran, my Shirazi heart, and Pakistan the young country, very young nation state there, to explore the impact of transnational networking and dialogue on identity construction among Muslim women. During these trips, I met with individuals in their homes and offices, as well as at international conferences and workshops. And by attending, of course, conferences and workshops, I was able to tap a broader pool of interviewees that included representatives from Turkey, Nigeria, Algeria, Afghanistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Canada, the US, and of course, various countries in Europe. In total, I conversed with approximately over 175 individuals most of the time through, of course, in-depth interviews, what I call active interviewing for you social scientists out there. I love that word. But in some cases, I spoke, of course, with multiple persons in focus groups. On the screen, you just get, once again, a sampling of some of those individuals and groups. Now, in each encounter, I sought to elicit the views of my interviewees on a range of topics, including the ethics of relationship between self and other, social values, and the transnational networking. The experiences were remarkable. There are not enough words to describe. And in those experiences, I was repeatedly struck by the richness of the transnational conversations that linked activists from different regions of the world in profound ways. I encountered South and Southeast Asian voices, not just in their expected milieus, but also in Egypt, Iran, and England, where they exchanged views with diverse counterparts and were themselves, of course, challenged and enriched. I entered into conversation with dynamic women whose horizons were conditioned but not constrained or circumscribed by nationality or cultural heritage. Now, unfortunately, there are many parts of this story which I shall leave out for tonight. But for tonight's presentation, I would like to highlight at least, I hope you don't mind, just maybe I should say three salient cross-cutting themes that emerged from the interviews. One, of course, the first one, experiences of marginalization, of being othered. Almost all of my interviewees saw transnational networking as a vital way of responding to discouraging experiences of marginalization in their own local contexts. 
to negotiating difference and discovering shared meaning. Most interviewees were struck by the extent to which their own experience differed from those of the Muslim women of other, of course, nations and cultures. However, sustained, and that's a very important word, sustained interaction with women from other localities did in fact contribute to the development of shared meaning despite differences and difficulties. And three, of course, reimagining self as a composite of opposites. Many individuals experienced transnational dialogue as a process that helped them reconceptualize their own identities to integrate within themselves some of the diverse cultural, historical, and intellectual currents within which their lives are situated. And so, of course, I'm going to briefly talk about each of these points now. First, from these interviews, one particular theme that was repeatedly testified by interviewees as a shared experience was the experience of being essentialized as someone else's other. In other words, most of my interviewees felt as if they were constantly finding that their own efforts to achieve clear self-identity were sharply contrasted and constrained by stereotypical categories. These preconceptions and stereotypes were linked to a number of dichotomies, secular versus Islamic, traditional versus modern, oriental versus occidental. So you could say, whatever way in which a Muslim woman activist attempts to define and project her identity, she faces the prospect of having this identity rejected through negative contrast with another collective label, a label that corresponds with expectations derived from a competing cultural and ideological tendency. Whatever choices she makes in life, she faces, you could say, the alienating prospect of existing as someone else's other. The four categories that emerged during my interviews were, of course, the traditional other, the oriental other, the occidentalized other, and the Islamized other. For tonight's presentation, I'll only talk about the first two, two categories, mm -hmm. the traditional other and the oriental other. So in my interviews, Many Muslim women were sensitive about being categorized as the traditional other. They reported that because they adhered to many traditional roles or forms, they often found themselves pressured to conform to a complete package of prescriptions restricting involvement in public life. One of my first encounters with South Asian contributions to transnational dialogue among women activists took place in Iran when I interviewed an Iranian woman who cited a Pakistani woman by the name of Farida Shahid, and I'll talk about her later, as her leading inspiration. This Iranian interviewee, Mahbube Abbas Khulizadeh, also had much to say about stereotypical women's roles. Mahbube was a former housewife turned editor of Tehran's Farzane, Journal of Women's Studies. And she states the following, quote, I feel a pride in following traditional values of my family and being a representative of such tradition. However, my adherence to tradition does not automatically presume that I have no rights. On the contrary, Muslim women who desire to participate in intellectual, religious, and political institutions need not be labeled as non-traditional." End quote. Mahbube. I'll just add here to my notes. This is a woman, too, who when I asked her to define 
herself. She used um, Hans Christian Andersen's story of the ugly duckling. And at the end of the interview, she says, well, you know, the transnational is a way for all us ugly ducklings <laughs> to know that there are other ugly ducklings out there. Yeah. Mahbube, as well as other interviewees, reported that in a day and age in which efforts to reaffirm Islamic authenticity have become heightened. They felt, you could say, they felt a strong pressure. A lot of these women who define themselves within a traditional label or have been defined by a traditional label felt a strong pressure to justify their engagement in social, moral, economic, and political activities. All right. Now, while this traditional other role stereotype was mentioned by many, there were other interviews who, and interviewees who placed equal or stronger emphasis on the fact that Muslim women in general are often represented as the uh -oh, oriental other from a Western standpoint. Interviewees from contexts as diverse as monarchical, I'm not saying it right, monarchical <laughs> Morocco and revolutionary Iran, knowing all these languages, hmm, expressed acute anxieties about how Orientalist images of oppressed and exotic Muslim women may be serving a larger neo-colonial project. They worried that their own work on behalf of Muslim women could easily be misrepresented by Western scholars, like myself, whose work might provide ideological legit legitimation for Western hegemony over Muslim lands. Many of these themes emerged in an interview with Nilam Hussein, a founder of the Samurk Women's Resource and Publication Center in Lahore, Pakistan. For Hussein, such Orientalist tropes were part of a daily struggle. She described how the Western media, as well as the policy elite, and much of the academy continue to generate neo-Orientalist images of passive, subjugated Muslim women in the need of liberation by external forces. And Nilam was not alone in this perception. Rather, many other interviewees emphasized the implications of Western and specifically US foreign policy providing a basis for the deepening humiliation of foreign domination as well as for the intensification of reactionary forces in their own societies. As stated by Nilam's daughter, Maryam Hussein, an artist in Lahore, quote, US foreign policy and Islamic fundamentalism are ideological products of othering. They continue to reinforce a definition of Muslim identity as bound by dichotomies, end quote. In other words, both U.S. policymakers and many Muslims face profound difficulty accepting diversity and feel compelled to define their identities and values through adversarial relations. Maryam would later say in the interview, quote, there is a need to transcend binary oppositions which shape Muslim women's lives and reimagine the Muslim woman as a collage of habitation." End quote. She would add that each Muslim woman needs to learn how to cohabit within herself in order to transform dichotomies of self-other dialogues, or transform dichotomies of self-other into dialogues. 
And the second major theme from my interviews concerned m m women's awareness and negotiation of difference and their shared and discovery, you could say, of shared meaning. It is interesting that a shared feeling of otherness or marginality did not in itself provide a basis for experiencing sameness among these women activists. Rather, the more they engaged in transnational dialogue at various conferences and forums, the more they became aware of their own particularities as women and as Muslims from different cultures, histories, ethnicities, legal structures, interpretive tendencies, ideological politics, you name it. Basically, through experiences of transnational dialogue, both their sense of local particularism and their feelings of transnational solidarity increased. In an interview with Farida Shahid, she emphasized that respect for differences is the basis for all of the networks in which she works. And Farida, who's located on the very top of this slide, in the left hand, oh, the left hand corner, is a very transnational figure, a probably truly transnational figure. Like many of my interviewees, she started as an activist in Lahore, Pakistan, working on women's issues at a local women's resource center, and then she became the co-director of Shirkaka, a national women's organization which has four regional offices located throughout Pakistan. She then also became the director of and coordinator of Women Living Under Muslim Law, which of course is the tra largest transnational Muslim women's organization, has representatives over s in over 70 countries. In my interview, Fareed pointed out, Frida pointed out that, quote, for Shirka Ga and the Women Living Under Muslim Law Network, our objective is to try and inform women about the differences that exist, which all may be called Muslim. In the network, the first collective work that we did was an exchange program, which we would define as a success since it opened the minds of the participants to difference. We deliberately had two plans of action. The first, we brought together various diverse resource persons, persons who spoke from within the framework of interpretations and theology, as well as people from the opposite genre who were absolutely quote-unquote secular. We did this so that women could experience um, all of the diversity between those two. And so she goes on, um, two, we also sent Muslim women from one Muslim context to live in a very different context. So we took women from Southeast Asia and South Asia and sent them to the Middle East. We took women from the Middle East and sent them to the Far East." End quote. So for Farida, facing and investigating differences in the experiences of Muslim women is essential for enabling them to overcome isolation and imagine possibilities for change. As she put it in an interview, diversity must become a resource for solidarity and shared meaning to emerge. And according to Farida and many other interviewees, successful transnational networking requires being open to differences, being willing to reconceptualize areas of cultural divergence in order to impose limits on conflicts and enhance an ability of Muslim women to respond constructively to adversaries. As they grappled with differences between their personal experiences, values, and contexts, they were challenged to find bases for solidarity, not only in the things they shared in common, but also in the necessity of respecting difference. And this brings us, of course, to the third major theme, reimagining self as a composite of opposites. Now, even though my interviews with individuals engaged in transnational dialogue suggested that Muslim women are seeking to form their identities in the midst of various processing of othering, negotiating differences, and experiencing shared meaning, 
I also found that many of my interviewees understood their own identities not as monolithic, static entities that can be boxed in, but rather as complex composites of multiple social elements and currents, which included aspects of the traditional as well as the modern, secular as well as the religious. Thus, many interviewees do not find, you could say, their activism or that activism and freedom of expression must come at the expense of sacred meaning and religious belief. Nor are they satisfied with attitudes that oppose political participation and autonomy to collective loyalty and historical memory. So the testimony of many interviewees suggests that many activist Muslim women are attempting to define their identities in ways that reject the rigid, stereotypical dichotomies that are pervasive in our social environments. And of course, I talked about that at the beginning of this talk. And I love saying this, that all of these interviewees are living through isms, secularism, Islamism, traditionalism, orientalism. And all of these isms have shaped their identity. Thus, for many Muslim women, identity is a matter of ongoing negotiation, self-knowledge, other knowledge, and dialogue evolve together. And I would also like to add that in this process of negotiating identity that circumscribes or empowers their social agency, many Muslim women are connecting to larger social, religious, national, and transnational communities. Such spatial extensions of the self appear to be founded upon shifting habits of self-identification that allow many Muslim activists to engage at local and global levels and to embrace and redefine pluralism. You could also say redefine cosmopolitanism if you want to put it in there. And many of my interviewees emphasize the inescapability of such change and the challenges of reconciling multiple values and visions. During the course of my interviews in Pakistan, I was directed by Muslim women activists, particularly Farhat Naz Rahman, who's the General Secretary of Rahm, Women's Research Organization in Karachi, to the office of Dr. Manzuruddin Ahmed. I don't know if that many of you know of him, but I hope you've wasted half of your lifetime if you don't know Dr. Manzuruddin Ahmed a former professor of political science and philosophy, as well as the vice chancellor of the University of Karachi. And Ahmed, so it was fascinating. I was having these amazing interviews with women in Karachi, and all of them said, you have to go meet Manzuruddin. So they took me to him. This was not planned. Um, and Ahmed shared a perspective on dialogue as a means of bridging, or perhaps to toggling between, quote, traditional or postmodern values. By offering an attitude that seeks to live with complementary contradictions. I found that this way of defining dialogue resonated in a powerful way with themes I was already hearing from Muslim women activists, and why? He emphasized that dialogue becomes real and sustainable when people are able to acknowledge internal contradictions in their senses of identity and in their intellectual outlooks. And the following quote captures his distinctive way of articulating tensions which the activists were grappling on on a very daily basis. So here's the quote, and it's long, sorry about that. In religion, power is more absolutized. You consider yourself as right and the, t the other as totally wrong. So there is a basic, hmm, so there is a question of basic contradiction. 
and the emphasis on elimination of the other who contradicts. This contradiction makes civil society difficult. The difficulty with each and every religion, including Islam, is that there is such a sharp differentiation between right and wrong. If one exists, the other must be eliminated. This is the problem. This law of contradiction is a universal law, and we will eventually realize that this law of contradiction only applies in the abstract world, and not in the real, concrete, existential world. And he stressed this next sentence. I have so many contradictions within myself, but I am still one. Hmm. And the quote goes on. A part of myself goes on fighting with another part of myself, and yet I am still one. When you are living a life and you are in an existential situation, you have to live with contradictions as realities existing in your life. Religions in the beginning were not such. What happened with every religion, especially Abrahamic traditions, that in the beginning, the prophets were reformers. They came to reform. Later on, there was a system, a construction. Difference emerges in different constructions of what was to be reformed. The moment the religion becomes a dogma, and the moment the dogma acquires the methodology of Greek logic, then fractalization happens. A dogma becomes a construct. This is why there is so much emphasis on deconstructing these dogmas and mythologies. All of us have these mythologies. And then he emphasized this last sentence. Dialogue is only possible in the religion when and if we critically examine this law of contradiction, which has become a self-evident ruse in explaining religions like Islam." End quote. So accepting the existential reality of contradiction and not forcing the complexities of life and of religion into closed, exclusive, system-seeking dominance is a key, is a key. And I just want to add, to the dynamism of understanding Muslim women activists. And like Ahmed, women have been finding that when the inev inevitability of contradiction and diversity is embraced, new opportunities for learning and new stories, of course, start to emerge. So to conclude, let me state that it was, of course, a great privilege to be able to visit directly with so many beautiful women and so many organizations and begin to discover how much they have depended on one another, challenged one another, and learned from one another. The stories I have been hearing convince me that transnational dialogue has come to play a very vital role in women's civic activism throughout the Muslim world, not just in the strategic or practical sense, but also as a process that is reshaping convictions and visions. And it contributes to the success of activities at the local level, while also being a means by which women reformulate self-understandings and judgments at the global level. Through the stories of these women, we can learn a great deal about how to find our own authentic voices through a process of dialogue across borders and divisions, a process through which we confront, of course, our own cliches and stereotypes, and of course, to learn and embrace all others. And because the women I have described remind us that global and local activism and genuine dialogue are of equal importance if we wish to effect lasting, peaceful change in the world, I would like to leave you with one of my favorite quotes.
benefits from a truly cosmopolitan citizen, a wandering dervish, Persian poet known as Sadi of Shiraz, who comes from my father's hometown. I'll just leave those words for you. Can you all see the words? No? Oh, Thank you so much, Mina, for this wonderful speech, and thanks to the organizers for, um, for the whole event, for inviting, uh, inviting us and um, for inviting me to give a comment to this keynote speech, which is, which is indeed a difficult task after listening to you for a long time and getting to know so many things, then what is left to be commented on? Well. Um, you have pointed out to us, Mina, and elaborated upon three cross-cutting themes that emerged basically from your interviews with the women, women activists most of the time. I would like to relate to this number at least and reduce my comment to three themes too, which may serve um, to connect in a way to what you, Mina, have shared with us. Your Keynote gave us an idea of what you have been engaging in during the field work for your wonderful book. Um, it's a revelation, this book indeed. So let me also relate to three themes, but very different themes, I guess. Um, and if I may take the book into consideration here too, I think we might reflect on three things which are, on the one hand, the perception and meaning of the transnational, which I would like to reflect upon a little bit. And then, um, second, the identification of, um, let's say, rallying points, rallying points such as um, the labels you mentioned, Muslim women, uh, Islamic values, whatever. And then third, if I have time, um, things like the West Islam, the religious, the secular, these binaries. When I'm running out of time, um, just knock me off, Nadia. I can easily skip the third one, but, but only the third. So, theme one, um, the term transnational. You mentioned in your book, Mina, that you were noticing a quote unquote, mounting evidence of growth in transnational women's activism and that you then wanted to know more about it. Quote again, questions about the meaning of the transnational for Muslim women remained unanswered during the time you started your field work. That's what you stated. Well, today, I believe um, you have allowed us a glimpse of what you came across when you did your field work. You emphasized the living contradictions and the complementary contradictions in particular. What comes into my mind now, particularly as a um, political scientist by discipline, when reflecting upon the transnational, that is the um, genealogy, genealogy of the term within the academic debate. In political science, we have for quite a long time been dealing with international organizations and with the United Nations as its most prominent um, representative. International organizations, however, were basically organizations on the state level. That is to say, intergovernmental organization and organizations and others endorsed with a mandate to act for the state. 
increasing mobility then, communication and increasing activity in the corporate world, in the private sector and in civil society, they all led to the feeling that the term international no longer fits its object of reference. The term transnational then was coined to apply to transnational social movements, transnational advocacy networks, um, and of course transnational corporate enterprises. And transnational civil society based movements and advocacy groups in particular have become connected nowadays to norm generating, norm changing, and also agenda setting functions on the national as well as on the international level. And I want to leave out the local level, which is very important, but due to time constraints, I um, wouldn't want to elaborate on that. We have, for instance, been talking for quite some time um, about the expected or even the real boomerang effect when it comes to transnational social movements or to transnational, transnational activity. And I wonder whether this, this boomerang effect also holds true for the women you have described to us, well, women and women activists, women who seek to surpass binaries and cliches um, and more or less conventional ideas. What does the acknowledgement of difference mean for the achievement of goals and objectives? For example, with reference to enhancing certain rights. Or is this is the reconstruction of meaning the final goal of such transnational activity. In terms of the boomerang, boomerang effect, what can we expect as, let's say, repercussions on the national or on the local level? Is there such a thing that comes back when you um, have been describing to us what uh, yeah, well, what, what comes out of all this wonderful transnational activity? Could we talk about a boomerang effect of some kind? Um, second point, the rallying points. What I particularly like about your book and today's speech, of course, is this deconstruction of binary and otherwise compartmentalized language, traditionalist, orientalist, progressive, moderate, you name it. Um, and I fully subscribe to the idea that um, such separations or boxes, as you say, um, are far away from the empirical reality. Yet I would like to raise um, another thought and try to trace back the development of the women's movement in general in the international arena, that is the level of the United Nations as a case in point. In the early post-colonial years when the non-aligned movement was formed, the term transnational was not as fashionable as it is today, not yet. The compartments, so to speak, in which women found themselves were formed and defined by the political and ideological frames and by the sheer power relations within the Cold War setting. So we saw women from developing countries who found common ground in identifying themselves as women of the South, best symbolized maybe with the uh, founding of the network DAWN, Development Alternatives for um, Women in a New Era. There, DAWN's and other women's of the 
the so-called Global South, their concerns were utterly different from those of women in the West or the North, if you like, or the so-called developed countries. There were huge debates in the UN about what should we strive for. You are so different. Why should we subscribe to a sentence like sisterhood is global? We are so utterly different. We are coming from a developing country and we have completely, con completely different, different concerns. We found, on the other hand, women from the socialist and women from the capitalist camp who also backed to differ in the interpretation of women's role and women's liberation, and so on. All these women in their various identity corpuses, we might say, rallied around something that provided a sense of a shared identity. We are coming from the South, so we share some identity. We are coming from the socialist camp, so we share a certain identity until, I mean, it was really a, a fierce debate, a quarrel, so to speak. <coughs> until, well, until the slogan of sisterhood is global became <coughs> attractive again and served the purpose of formulating common strategies despite a huge amount of differences. So I wonder whether we are witnessing yet another version now of sisterhood is global this time by recognizing Muslim sisterhood is global. It comes to my mind when I think of what you have been sharing with us. A whole lot of differences, but coming to shared ideas when exchanging, in, uh, exchanging opinions and getting into dialogue. Now the third point, okay, the third point, <laughs> the third point is very, um, very brief and very easy, only two, two or three sentences. <clears throat> when we favor, and I do so, and I like that idea, when we do favor deconstruction and reconstruction rather than working with polarized and exclusivist templates, how do we then go about Islam and the West, religious and secular? For me, I admit mm, there would be no polarization whatsoever. But on the contrary, a lot of overlapping, at least within the individual identity. I wouldn't be able myself to separate between religious and secular. It doesn't contradict. I can be a believing, I am a believing woman feeling very secular. So it, it just doesn't contradict, it does never polarize. And I wonder whether labels such as Islam versus the West, whether they have to be considered as polarizing labels. So I would be curious to get to know other opinions on that, particularly your opinion, of course, um, and also, of course, reflect on the other two terms, the rallying points and the transnational, and that's about it. Thank you. So we would now like to show you the film The Ghetto Girl, which was released in 2011 and which is screened for the first time in Germany tonight. We are extremely happy um, that the director, Amberin Alkader, um, is here with us tonight so that we can talk about her film afterwards. Amberin is an alumnus of the renowned AJ Kidwai Mass Communication Research Center at Jamia Milia Islamia in Delhi. And she's currently a Fulbright Nehru Scholar at the Temple University, where she's developing her MFA thesis titled A Day in the Life of Aisha, as a way of synthesizing her interest in documentary and experimental methods with narrative approaches to storytelling. 
The Ghetto Girl is a film about a girl who obsessively walks the streets in a predominantly Muslim neighborhood in South Delhi. And I quote from Ambarin's director's statement here, it is a voice that emerges as the girl approaches the idea of walking as strategy, an everyday practice that lets her blur boundaries between the binaries of insider-outsider, documentary, fiction, oppressor, victim, amateur professional, liberal fundamentalist, <clears throat> much in the way the reenacted home movie that she creates complicates boundaries <clears throat> between truth, fiction, and history, memory, end of quote. Her mother in red bell bottoms and the girl making a home movie. She does not know where these memories come from and how they are a part of an erased history. अमेरिका में हुए आतंकी हमले 9-11 के तर्ज पर एक और हमला होने वाला है और इस बार निशाने पर है भारत। she emerges from her dream overlooking a road that leads home. के मुसलमान लोग ज़्यादा हैं शुरू से ए टू जेड तो इसकी लेकर के हमें लोग टेररिस्ट कहते हैं। हमारा घर तो यार तो काफी दूर है मतलब। so there's one more chai wala over here, but again I can't come here. It's not that I haven't been in trouble because of these um, visits. जहाँ तक आपके तस्वीरों का ताल्लुक है तो ये भी आपका एक ज़रूरी काम है इसलिए हम इसमें खिंचवा तो सकते हैं लेकिन इन केस की जैसे कहीं मैं शादी में बैठी हूँ तो वहाँ पर मूवी बन रही है उसमें मैं अवॉइड करना ही ज़्यादा बेहतर समझती हूँ कि ठीक है अगर हम बच जाएँ फोटोग्राफी से तो अच्छा है So, Ambarin, <clears throat> I think we should start by giving the audience um, a little bit of background information about um, <clears throat> the Butler House encounter, or what was officially called the Operation Butler House, which was mentioned in the beginning of the film. Um, is in around 2008 September, uh, on a morning, uh, there was an armed police operation in the neighborhood in which the police uh, broke into an apartment and there was an exchange of fire and it was it's still being it's 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 debatable whether that was from both sides or it was only from the side of the police but the the, the officials and the unofficial versions were very different um, three boys were shot down uh, and and they were shot down and saying that they were terrorists and their activities were suspicious and two boys, and one of those who was shot down was under 17. Uh, and he, uh, he, so if you're below a certain age, you're covered by a completely different set of laws. But nevertheless, three were shot down, and two of them were reported to have escaped. And what happened after the incident, this is a very specific thing that happened on a day in September. But after that, the whole reporting around this neighborhood was that this is a production house of terrorists and people who live here are terrorists. So there was a whole engineering of stories um, around the place and people who live there. And that's when the film got commissioned and it was a film about this neighborhood. And a part of the commission was that if the mainstream has spoken of this space in a certain way, what are the other ways in which we can talk about this space? So. How would you describe your relationship with the documentary filmmaking? It's interesting. I was, I was watching it uh, again on, with all of you here. And I feel that twice my mother in, the fi in, in, in her interviews uh, spoke about the coincidence. And she spoke about that you're, it's not intended, but it happens. And the kind of work I do, I'm, I, I want to to be and document that space, a space which is not um, very well codified or very well articulated because I think that's where the contradictions are and my practices emerges out of very contradictory material. Documentary for me um, allows and gives me a set of, uh, uh, a set of uh, strategies to, to, uh, to interrogate those spaces, spaces which are invisible, spaces which are beyond the mainstream, um, and um, 
and spaces which which are very coincidence uh, coincidental spaces which are uh, which keep changing which are very fluid so uh, the documentary with its with 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 the smaller equipment smaller crew uh, most of the times i'm working on my own and i usually work with my camera person very closely uh, and i'm editing my material it gives me the space to work with my material very closely uh, in in that sense, and and I think that's that's one of the the it's it's a very rewarding process for me because um, if I wonder of a very big scale of production and I feel that that's a very different process and uh, just the power of a, of a documentary camera of a smaller more fluid camera uh, that can move in certain spaces. I mean, though definitely I never shoot. Uh, with a hidden camera ever in my work because I, th I think there are issues with the, with the people that you photograph with but even though it's a visible camera and sometimes it does become very confrontational also uh, I feel that it it allows you to hold yourself up for questions that your people you are working with have and it allows it, it. It also when I it, it is a very it's a it's a it's a relationship which is w where even I I feel that I'm op I, or at least I try to be be at a level where I'm I can be questioned by people I work with, um, and 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 the power equation is is not what it usually is. If if I were not doing documentary, let's say I was doing news work. Um, and that would be a very different dynamic. So I wonder if that, uh, yeah. I mean, you're working or what you were describing, this all takes place in a highly politicized situation and in um, a situation where, as we heard before, as we discussed um, before, opinions about the Muslim minority in India, about gender roles among Muslims in India is so polarized. So I really wonder how you, you manage to put that into practice and also where you um, situate your own work. Um, my first work, uh, this is the third uh, film that I have made out of it and this also I'm, I'm in the process of making the film with a lot of, un uh, with a lot of interviews that I edited out of the film uh, because you're always constantly in a film, you're working with linear, linear material, so you edit out a lot of things. Uh, and I'm, I'm working with that uh, edited out footage as a part of an interactive web project because I think that my relationship to spaces is defined by concepts of interactivity also increasingly now that I'm studying film again. But uh, it was in 2002 that I did the first film, which was a film about three women who live in this uh, neighborhood and who dress up as men. and. Um, and again, I was following women and following them through the space and, and using the camera's mobility and the character, the, the people who were in the film, their mobility as a way to explore their worlds. Um, and I feel that inherently, I've, this spa spaces are contradictory. They're not defined by one set of uh, of, of, of things, I think uh, they are very fluid, spaces are fluid and I, and I have tried to work with, with concepts that embrace that kind of contradiction rather than trying to make, a f make uh, rather than defining my practice as a way that um, you know, weans out contradiction. I want to embrace contradictions and work with that and I think that's how I structured this film as a walk uh, through the neighborhood from the perspective of a woman because it is an inherently uh, contradictory position in many ways. Uh, and it is also a position which if, you are, if one is aware of the context from which this is emerging, it is a position where uh, you are aware of the negotiating power of this fictional girl who walks in the neighborhood. Um, just the experience of walk is a very contradictory experience. You, uh, you encounter different things, you encounter, and you allow yourself, uh, you make yourself available for, for that experience of, uh, of contradictions, uh, unlike a car or a, or a, or a subway, car, subway train which, in which you move from one place to the other. In a walk, you experience the space in an immersive way, so sounds, um, in my work, I try to create that experience through an immersive soundscape and, and, and using visual materials to, to work with, 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 
uh, with material that's really contradictory, uh, and I'm still in the process of um, working towards uh, some of those ideas. I would like to ask you a fourth question and then open the floor for your um, question and comments um, about the audience. Do you have an audience in mind when you <coughs> a shoot? Or um, did you have an audience in mind for this film and when you actually screened it in Delhi or outside of Delhi or in the US, I think, last week? Yeah. Um, what was your experience so far? What were the reactions? How was it received, the Ghetto Girl? I think uh, this film, the, the material was shot in India and I carried all that material with me uh, to the US where I was, uh, I'm, I'm still on a, f I'm, I'm in a fellowship and I was working with images there and it became a very unique and an interesting experience for me because I was working with images that, that were not about that place. So, this, so sometimes I used to feel that I, I am just in love with these images and the way they, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, part of my world and um, I would edit sequences where I would feel that I'm, I'm putting uh, a very personal uh, relationship with those images before and over uh, a way in which my audience or people who watch this work would interpret it. And I think that has become uh, a very important part of this project because I feel that I don't know if there is a way to work where I, 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 I determine uh, my audiences increasingly in times when people are watching work on YouTube and people are watching, um, just the whole idea of audience has changed so, so much over the past years. I'm developing this into an interactive project and with that it will be accessible to people all across the globe, uh, wherever people have inter internet uh, connections. So, uh, and, and I feel that, that, that the purpose, and that's why documentary of a certain kind of, of documentary practice really f uh, inspires and fascinates me because um, it allows for a, di for a dialogue, it allows for an exchange between two people and you know sometimes I think uh, mi miscommunication or, or limited communication is sometimes is what it is bit when people talk across d what are understood to be boundaries. So, um, but nevertheless, that's always there. Um, so maybe, you know, I'm not predetermining my audiences in a way that, you know, if X person in this place watches it, will, he, will she understand what I'm trying to say? Maybe that won't happen, but it will, uh, it will allow us to talk and, and, and start a process of, of trying to understand what I'm not understanding about that, per of, of, about that person or what that person is not understanding about me. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I have been do, uh, working and increasingly, it's, it's interesting how when you institutionalize yourself through a study uh, of, I've, I've been studying film again, uh, a large part of that program of, would be towards trying and understanding audiences in a very predetermined way. So one has to be aware of that. That side. <laughs>